We're at the RNC, and we've got a curious interview for you guys. It's a congressman, but he's a Democratic congressman. So a little twist there. Uh, Ruben Gallego from Arizona. So what uh, brings you to a Republican convention? Well, we're here to be the voice of opposition, uh, make sure that America knows that what the uh, Republicans are offering, what Donald Trump is offering, is not the only choice. Uh, I'm particularly here to talk about national security. As an Iraq war veteran, Marine combat veteran, I want people to understand that Donald Trump is a very risky choice uh, for America and really for world stability, and, and they need to know that. Why? Uh, he, he says he's going to be super strong and that that'll solve things. Yeah, I mean, that's the problem. It's like uh, his foreign policy is just based on bluster, bravado, uh, and these ideas of strongman uh, dictatorships. You know, when you're looking up to people like Putin, like King Jong-il, and all these other people and saying that they're, they're good, they do good things, that's not a good sign. And uh, that's a very big risk that I'm just not willing to take because it's going to end up being people in my district end up going doing all the fighting. Uh, and he'll just basically be able to you know, keep him and his kids uh, out of the fight. And it's just, we just can't have this. So, having gone to Iraq, what practical lessons did you learn there that you, that you can use as a congressman? I'm curious about that. Well, I mean, certainly the most helpful thing uh, for me was, um, you know, fearlessness. You, you know, if you're in Iraq and you're in the infantry, you have to do what you're supposed to do to keep yourself and your men alive. And, and that really has helped me in politics because a lot of what we end up doing is taking risks. Uh, not as big as risks, obviously, as Marines take nowadays, uh, but, you know, having to put your name out there, having to fight the establishment, having to, you know, go up, uh, you know, up a, a, a big steep to, to win some of these offices. But it's worthwhile in the end because you know you, know you have a job to do and, and you're going to do whatever it takes to win. How long did you serve in Iraq? I was there for seven months uh, in 2005. And uh, did you have any combat there? I did. I, unfortunately, my, my uh, company took some of the largest hits of the war, and they're based here in Ohio, Lima 325. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it was a heck of a war, unfortunately. So what do you gain out of that in terms of what you would do today? For example, ISIS comes out of the Iraq war, uh, and now they're here. It's, uh, it seems to be a scenario where damned if we do, damned if we don't. E easy for Trump to say, let's bomb them more, right. but we've already dropped 10,000 bombs on them and we still have all the attacks in Nice and San Bernardino and, and the list goes on and on. So bombing doesn't seem to be an the answer, but then what is the answer? Well, I th you know, when I was there, the most effective uh, times we were, especially when we were fighting insurgents, is when we weren't fighting insurgents alone. I remember going into villages, finding insurgents, getting rid of them or arresting them, uh, and then one month later coming back to that same village. Where we had success is when we worked with local uh, Iraqi National Guardsmen who actually understood the, the people there and, and helped up set up some governance. But the way to really stop ISIS or the al-Qaeda's of the world is really for us to foster uh, transparent uh, governments that are stable in that region and not prop up you know, governments that are basically going to be corrupt and encourage more sectarian violence than not. And that's a long-term project. America can't be involved in this uh, business if they're not willing to do long-term uh, work in a collaborative manner and not in just like this, you know, new imperialistic manner where we tell them how to build their government. And I mean, that's what's going to ha happen in post-Iraq. If we want Iraq to be a successful country, we have to help them actually become a country that can work together in a transparent manner to get rid of corruption uh, and really stop the sectarian strife that's been going on there for, for hundreds of years at this point. So a lot of progressives are a little worried that Hillary Clinton um, appears to be more hawkish uh, than they would like. So certainly more hawkish than Bernie Sanders, uh, although that might not be hard to do. Uh, but talked about how her foreign policy is going to be more muscular than, than Barack Obama's. What do you think that means? And, and are you concerned about that? I, I don't, again, it goes back to, okay, more muscular, and then what does that accomplish? Right. I, I'm not too concerned about that. I think, you know, every uh, situation needs to have a different answer. And, and uh, the thing that scares me about Donald Trump, that it seems like the only answer is always uh, aggressive, violent inaction in a unilateral manner. Uh, not everything is going to require us to bomb. 
and I don't think Hillary Clinton is, has the mindset that everything is going to require a bomb. I think there'll be smart uses of force, and I think there'll be also smart uses of diplomacy. And what you want to see in your your, in your president is a person that's willing to do use all mixes, uh, and and hopefully and always uh, war being the last result, uh, last uh, last resort. And I think that's what we see uh, in terms of the difference between uh, Trump uh, and Hillary is that you know I think Trump will likely use war as the first resort and not the last resort when it comes to the extension of American diplomacy. So right now um, Hillary Clinton has in aggregate about a four or five point lead in most of the polls. It depends a little bit on uh, whether Gary Johnson and Jill Stein are included in the polls. I don't find that very comforting uh, given that Donald Trump's a bit of a maniac and a Democratic candidate only has a four or five point lead. What do you think is going on there? Why isn't this a blowout? I think, yeah, one, most Americans don't really pay attention to the election until we get to the September-October break. Uh, I think the other thing to remember is if there's any indication of how bad this is going, let's look who's rallying around which candidates. There are no Democrats that are major party figures that are voting uh, Secretary Clinton. Uh, in this state right now, there is a senator, Senator Portman, who's running for re-election in a very competitive district, and in his home state, he is not attending the Republican National Convention. Mm -hmm. Right, and you're seeing that time and time again. If the the first people that always smell blood in the water when it comes to political tides are the politicians, and it's it's something to be said that there are so many prominent Republican governors, members of Congress, and senators that are not here right now talking. So, at the same time, there seems to be a significant anger in the country. Um, first of all, are you feeling that at all in your district, or no? I think my district is is frustrated. Um, like many other parts uh, of this country. Uh, it's a very working class area, uh, Latino and African American. They were the first ones uh, to get fired and they're the uh, last ones to get hired. Uh, but there is a sense of optimism uh, about where the future is going. What they want to see, uh, however, is some of that in politics. Uh, and uh, you know, they see a lot of what's occurring, especially coming from the, the Trump campaign, uh, some very cynical uh, campaign ploys to basically separate Americans and you know that scares my district when it's a district that is largely minority they know what happens when these types of tensions flare up and when politicians flare them up because we saw it in 2010 with SB 1070 and it's not a good result it's not a good end result for us so for the people who are frustrated uh, what is the democratic solution for the economy because what Trump's gonna say is Hey, look, uh, you know, you guys are frustrated, and obviously, if you elect another Democrat, you'll get the same thing as you did before. So, what's the Democratic answer to that? Well, the Democratic answer is that we have to, you know, reinvigorate our progressive values, and on, on a couple areas. One, expanding Social Security, uh, which will end up saving Social Security in, in, in the long run. Two, raising the minimum wage to something that's a living wage uh, as much as possible as we can. Uh, continuing to enhance and expand uh, the Affordable Health Care Act. Uh, and then I think also dealing with uh, rising college tuition as well as um, the student loan debt. You know, I think a lot of people are frustrated, especially adults that have kids, because they feel like their kids are missing out on the middle class America that they were promised. The reason they're doing that is because they can't afford even to plan for college anymore, because they can't afford to believe in the idea that they're going to be able to send their kids to college on the wages that they make now. And uh, if we can really uh, turn the, the ship around in those, those areas, I think we can really uh, reignite the American spirit when it comes to you know, believing in what we understand the American contract, which is an opportunity, you know, the opportunity to move up into the middle class or higher. And, and let me wrap up by asking you both about domestic and foreign policy on whether there's a concern that on some issues, obviously not on a lot, on some issues, Donald Trump is going to outflank Hillary Clinton on the left. So, mm. for example, being against the trade deals, against TPP, against NAFTA, that goes to that economic concern we were just talking about. And uh, also, uh, <laughs> uh, it, it felt like someone died in here. But <laughs> I don't know if you could pick that up on the mic. But um, let's hope not. Um, it is an open carry state. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the economic concerns where he goes to the left of Hillary Clinton and then on uh, foreign policy where he says, well, you know what, I, I don't want to be involved in all these Middle Eastern wars. So that's a more left position than Hillary right. Clinton. How do you address that? Well, I think the one thing we got to remember, I think Donald Trump doesn't really have any core. 
he uh, he will say what he believes uh, will get him the votes at that point and then switch later. Uh, I don't think he actually quite understands economic policies. While I agree with him and Hillary on her position on TPP uh, and the need for us to actually look at our trade deals, but uh, Donald doesn't actually believe in that. I mean, he is one of the biggest uh, exporters of jobs. If you look at where his t-shirts are made, he uh, uses uh, as many of the visa waiver programs so he could bring in workers at his hotels. Uh, you know, so he doesn't really believe in this. He doesn't even believe in, uh, in raising the minimum wage. This is just another parlor game trick that he's learned uh, from many years playing, uh, you know, in, uh, through, through The Apprentice. So I don't believe it, um, and more importantly, you know, we not just need, we don't just need to elect Hillary Clinton, but we also need to elect it, the most progressive Congress and Senate to make sure that we follow up with the promise that we're making to Democrats and working class people. It's one thing to get the presidency in there, but if you don't have the votes, then all you're doing is making promises. And we need to make sure that there's people there that are going to uh, that are pass bills and also hold us Democrats accountable at the same time. All right, Congressman, thank you for joining us. On thank the you answers. so much for your time. Appreciate it. Appreciate it.